Okay, so hello and welcome to the Ravens, a One Tree Hill podcast. I'm Simon and I am honoured today to be joined by set dressing prop master master, Matt Sullivan. Matt, thank you so much for your time. Welcome to the show and how are you? I'm doing well, Simon. Thank you. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Let me just say I was the set decorator for the show. Um, I did do a little bit of props in earlier seasons, but I took over as a set decorator in season five and finished the rest of the series. Excellent. Well, I, I, that would be great to. I'd love to know like the the distinguishing factors between like you know a prop master and a set dresser and all of those things. So we, we'll we'll get to all of that, and I look forward to being educated on it. I mean, just to say, firstly, uh, like parts of the props and the set dressing is something that I'm personally really into. Like I um, I kind of collect props. Like some of these things behind me, you can see. Uh, like these are some of the jerseys from the Mighty Ducks movies that, you know, are the actual ones. And I kind of really enjoy this, uh, the hunt of trying to find, uh, you know, like props that were used in TV shows and movies that I love and then trying to like match them on the screen and sort of trying to have like a little piece <laughs> of like the cinematic history, so to speak. I know it sounds really nerdy, um, but that is what it is. And that's who I am. Um, so there's so many things around that that, I can't wait to to sort of talk with you about. But if I was to take it all the way back, um, like how did you how did you get involved in set dressing, and uh, you know how did all of that manifest? Is it something that you had wanted to do, or you kind of fell into it, or how did how did you begin? Well, <clears throat> I wanted to be a filmmaker uh, pretty much all my life. Uh, ever since I gave up the idea of being a a professional football player when I was about uh, 14. Um, And so I I studied film production in college at Penn State University. Um, And shortly after graduation, I moved to North Carolina, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, where One Tree Hill, of course, was shot. Um, And I moved there specifically to get into the film industry and and try to work my way up. Uh, And shortly after I arrived in town, I got my first job and uh, kind of kicked around in various departments, uh, did a little bit of location work initially, uh, then got into doing props because I met a a great guy named Edward Tantar Levajur, who was an excellent prop master. Uh, around the same time, I also met uh, a wonderful British man named uh, Hugh Scaife, who was a longtime set decorator. Uh, he came over from England to work with Dino De Laurentiis in the early days of the studio here in Wilmington. And um, both Hugh and Tantar kind of became mentors of mine and taught me everything I know about the art department and doing props and set decorating. Uh, I worked with Tantar for a number of years, uh, working on the set as a prop person with him, and then started acting as a lead man for Hugh. Uh, The lead man is the kind of first in command for the set decorator in the in the art department hierarchy. Um, And so I worked with Hugh for a number of years and then um, started decorating myself. And that's kind of how I kind of had an aptitude for uh, the design sensibilities of of decoration. And uh, Hugh deemed me worthy of uh, starting to decorate myself. And so that's, that's where I began. Amazing. So, and so to give some distinguishing factors. So, what is there? Is there a difference between a set decorator and a set dresser? There is. Uh, this the set decorator is the department head. Uh, set decoration is a department of its own um, on a film, and the set decorator is the department head there. 
the lead man is, as I said previously, kind of the first in command for the decorator. And then there's a, a buyer or maybe multiple buyers, depending on the scale of the project. Um, and there are uh, possibly a set deck coordinator, someone to kind of be in the office and field questions and direct traffic and uh, handle paperwork. And then for the lead man, there is a crew of set dressers. And those are the guys who do the bulk of the heavy lifting, as it were. You know, they, mm-hmm. they make sure that all the goods that you need to get to set get there and are implemented properly. Uh, you know, they might be installing lighting one day, uh, hauling furniture the next day, uh, putting up, I don't know, fake pipes or, uh, you know, window dressing, whatever the set calls for, the set dressers do the installation and the uh, kind of moving around of all those materials. Right. So if like, so as an example, so say somewhere like uh, Karen's Cafe in uh, One Tree Hill, say they, they're going to go do a renovation because Karen, I'm just making this up, but say Karen's decided she's going to change something in there. Is it something where you'd be, that department would be given a set budget and to be able to do it? Or do they also have, like the Warner Brothers have, a warehouse where they have you know props and and things like that where you can just sort of borrow and then put back or is it a bit of both well it's a it's a bit of both it varies from project to project um it's interesting that you chose karen's cafe because uh we actually revamped that set twice um we shot karen's cafe in the same location as the initial closed over bros location which i i don't know where you are in watching the series like what season you're in Um, well i've i've seen the whole show five times um it's my my co-host uh he doesn't join on these because we keep him make sure that he isn't spoiled that he's seeing it for the first time and we're at the the beginning of season four for him but i've seen it a million times yeah okay well Nevertheless, the original Karen's Cafe was gutted and turned into the Close Over Bros store, um, which it was for two or three seasons. And then we revamped that and Haley made it back over into a new Karen's Cafe. And <clears throat> your question was, do we get a budget for that? Um, yes, we kind of create the budget ourselves in the you know the the art department hierarchy just to be clear there's a production designer who is the head of all things artistic um so the production designer then has an art director that he works he or she works very closely with in this case it was alan hook and bill davis was the art director um the art director and the set decorator are kind of on even ground in the hierarchy. Um, and the prop master is also kind of on equal ground there where the prop master handles all the handheld items that people deal with in scenes of the show, you know, from backpacks or laptops to handguns or, you know, food, stuff like that. Um, but the designer and the art director design the set that is to either be built or shot within a location. And then the set decorator works closely with them to decide what the elements in there are going to be. Um, so if you start with a blank slate, like Karen's Cafe was when we were turning it from Close Over Bros back into Karen's Cafe. Uh, The designer and art director drew up plans for the space once everything would be removed and, you know, did some sketches and drawings and then 
told me, you know, we talked about what kind of style it was going to be and what type of elements would be in there. We, you know, together chose the booth style and the lighting styles. And, you know, I gathered all that stuff together uh, along with my buyer. We brought in all these elements and the set dressers and well, of course, construction had to do a lot of building and paint had to paint the set before we got hold of it to hang all the lighting, install all the kitchen hardware, the, you know, food prep items, the counters, the stools, the booths, everything. So that's, it's an extremely collaborative effort that goes on. And between the designer and myself, we determined what we thought it was going to cost. And fortunately, we're pretty good at that. So we, our estimates come in pretty close to what the actual cost winds up being. And, you know, the producers approved. I, I don't recall them fighting us on many of the elements in that set in particular, but uh, uh, they approved the budget and then we implement the things. Had we been shooting this show in Los Angeles, say, where Warner Brothers does in fact have a gigantic prop and set dressing warehouse, uh, it's one of the greatest prop houses in the world, which is actually run by another friend of mine, a guy named Robert Greenfield, who's fantastic, awesome guy. Um, he has, you know, basically the whole history of Warner Brothers Studios at his disposal in this sprawling prop house. But we didn't really have access to that because we're 3,000 miles away and on the East Coast. So we had to source everything pretty much, you know, from scratch, um, which is what we typically do here in North Carolina. Although there are a, a couple of prop houses here in town one of which i run um and uh you know we're we're coming along in that regard but back then we there were no prop houses to be to be spoken of and we had to pretty much buy everything or rent it from other vendors this is all amazing i already have so, so many questions around <laughs> this stuff i'm trying to not be over eager um but i can't help it the, so oh. okay <laughs> well so with with regards to say like the booths and things that you've put into uh the new karen's cafe are these things that then go into storage into these prop houses so that in, you know here it, not here where you are in wilmington uh so that if you you know in future if another show wants to use them then they're you know they're at their at the disposal or is it something that you can maybe rent and then give back or how does that work well both things are true um at the end of one tree hill when it was all said and done season nine ended and the show wasn't coming back. Um, the guy I mentioned previously, Robert Greenfield, who runs the Warner Brothers Prop House, came to Wilmington to look through all the stuff we had accumulated over the nine seasons the show ran. Um, and he loved a lot of the set deck materials, including the booths specifically from Karen's Cafe writing and a number of other elements and, um, you know, considerably more than that, just from the show's nine seasons and ship that back to Los Angeles to incorporate into the prop house. Um, other, anything that we rented locally here in town, of course, we returned. Um, and then we had a massive sale uh, at the end of the show, which started out being open only to the cast and the crew and then was open to the public. Uh, and then it, I think there was maybe two days where it was an open sale to the public. And then we had an auctioneer come in and auction the rest of the stuff off in lots. So like I say, it, it, 
that's and that's common for uh just about any show whether it's a movie or a tv show the the studio if there is a parent studio that has a prop house um they'll come in and take the stuff that they think will be useful and then everything else is either sold or donated to charity or uh what have you that's so cool and i'm so devastated that uh you know obviously i couldn't be there (laughs) to be at that sale because i've actually accumulated a couple of items that i've like bought through ebay and you know places like that where people had bought them from uh that sale at the end like i have some of the uh like basketball gym bags and and things like that that people had yeah got from there uh, but then you end up paying like extortionate prices because you know they know that they can do that because you know that there there are no others um but i get that supply and demand yes that's, that's the world we live in <laughs> but um okay and then so the prop house in at warner brothers I have to ask this just because as it's coming up. Uh, so I, in particular, I've been hunting for a long time, years, um, for the Ravens jerseys, like to be able to try, like how I've got some of these Mighty Ducks ones, to be able to try and find a real one used in the show. And I've, sp- I've spoken to so many different people and tried to find them. And uh, I was told that they probably exist in a box in the Warner Brothers warehouse somewhere. Are, are you able to confirm this, that these will never be anywhere to be bought or whatever and then if so why do they do that just in case the show gets like rebooted one day or something well a lot of that very particular type stuff is archived at the studio um you know they any kind of iconic props or costumes or in rare cases set dressing items uh, they put in the archives and they they may have a <coughs> a little display area or a you know archive museum kind of situation where they um hold those things and i don 't know that they open it to the public ever but uh they keep them just for historic reasons um, i think i kn- i know f- that that type of costume wear does go back to the studio um, and they might well be in the costume department at Warner brothers, which they, they have an equally huge costume department there. You know, Warner brothers has a sprawling studio lot where tons of productions are made. And those shows have the luxury of, shopping at the prop house or the wardrobe department and you know using those things if it's a warner brothers production i don't think they even charge them to use the stuff um it's just kind of in their budget already uh so they um they might well still be sitting in a box in some kind of uh you know moth free chamber where they can uh could be accessed um <laughs> if i think if i think of it i'll ask my friend uh robert greenfield the next time i talk to him and just see if he knows anything about that please do I- yeah. <laughs> if he can draw me a map i'm indiana jones style my way in there <laughs> yeah probably is just about big too well okay if we so if we take it back to you um when how did you first get introduced into you know the production of of one tree hill um like you said you came in in like the fifth season um yeah Yeah. so how did that manifest well uh i previous to one tree hill i did another similar tv series called dawson's creek which (laughs) you're with Um, yes (laughs) as as you probably know then that was also filmed here in Wilmington North Carolina um and there were some actors that actually appeared on Dawson's Creek that also wound up being on One Tree Hill Chad Michael Murray being one of them um but 
at the time that we were finishing Dawson's Creek, uh, they came to town with the pilot for One Tree Hill. I was hoping to do the pilot, but the season finale for Dawson's Creek was so involved that I couldn't sort of do both projects at the same time and they wound up being simultaneous. So I didn't do the pilot and neither did our production designer, um, just again, because of the crossover. So they hired different people to do One Tree Hill. And then uh, when they came, when it got picked up to go to series, they rehired those folks, you know, which were also friends of mine. So, you know, cheers to them for, for getting that job. Well, they did it for the first three seasons, I think. Um, and then the guy who was our production designer on uh, Dawson's Creek, again, Alan Hook, great friend of mine. Um, he, he got hired to replace the production designer uh, and took over the show. He kept the existing decorator, um, you know, because he didn't want to rock the boat or what have you. Um, but then uh, I actually, uh, another friend of mine, Robbie Beck, was the prop master of the show. And I wound up uh, agreeing to work with him for, I guess it was seasons three and four. Um, and I, so I worked as kind of the first prop assistant on set for those two seasons. So I got to know the cast pretty well then, um, you know, working with them every day. And all the while I was still decorating other projects when uh, time allowed, but the being on One Tree Hill in that prop capacity allowed me to stay at home where, uh, you know, I was, recently married and uh building my family so i wanted to be at home as much as i could um but then when se it came time for season five uh alan wanted to make a change and he asked me to step in and become the set decorator and you know we wound up doing the next five years or five six seven eight nine so five years together as a team he, uh, Alan, Bill Davis, and myself. It's, and Rob. It, it is so funny because, I mean, you're obviously talking about these people that, you know, are your friends and former colleagues or colleagues. And it's like, I know them because I recognize the names from the credits, you know. Um, <laughs> they're, well, I guarantee they're, they're all real people, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> no I think they're all just you and you're just going under different aliases <laughs> not hardly It'd be impossible to do all that work myself <laughs> well that was so good we had so many talented people working on it and and not just in the art department the camera personnel the I mean the producers and directors and you know obviously a talented cast and um great makeup and hair and costumes and grips electrics uh carpenters everyone i mean we just had a fantastic crew that was used to working together and uh you know just made made everything go seamlessly i mean it was it was not an easy show in the sense that um there was a lot of location work and it was very fast paced you know we we'd shoot five six seven eight nine pages a day and that is a lot um, of material to cover and often you know two or three different locations per day um, but because the crew was so well oiled uh, we were able to pull it off and and still have a good time yeah and I think a lot of like all of the people that you were just saying can be like the, un the unsung heroes of shows and, and movies that you know us as fans all love I mean we all kind of just look towards like the cast and and the director you know where actually like you said it's such a massive collaborative 
effort um so yeah that's that's so awesome i mean when when you were working on the show were you watching the show as well like were you a fan of it or was it something where you know you enjoyed the camaraderie and the people but you weren't necessarily you know a, a fan of the end product like as in it maybe just wasn't for you yeah it was not really the type of show that i would typically choose to watch you know i mean at the at the end of the day it's a, a teenage soap opera you know there's there's no escaping that i mean and that you know is not the typical uh viewing for a a, a man in his late 30s early 40s um or whatever i was at the time um so i mean i I watched the show to see, to make sure that everything looked good. Um, but not as a fan, you know, I mean, it was, imagine watching yourself at work, um, seeing, you know, the stuff you, you just did then replayed essentially. Um, it's when you're, working on a show it's hard to disassociate yourself with it to just watch it with you know untainted eyes and and just enjoy it from a a fan perspective um i mean i can i can do that with other shows and movies and you know i can easily suspend my disbelief to to watch literally anything else but the things that i have done myself i'm so woven into it that it's it's not easy to separate and kind of become a fan you know what i mean yeah that makes total sense i mean it's on complete different levels but i mean i can't even listen to the podcast that we do back because i feel so self-critical and oh you could have asked that question better or could have said this better and so yeah i i I get it to a level, not to the level that, you know, you guys were operating at. Um, well, okay. So, I mean, if I just was to park One Tree Hill for a second, I've got loads of questions about it as well. I don't want it to like just completely overrun everything. Um, but I mean, I saw that you also, you worked on My Girl. I mean, that is a classic movie. And I have to ask, I hope you had nothing to do with the bees. <laughs> um well, I didn't have uh, anything to do with the bees more so than working on the set did. We we did have some live bees. We had a, a beekeeper there um, who brought them and, you know, no bees were harmed on in the, my girl. Um, but we had a, a fake hive that the prop master had put together. We had several of them. Um, and we had some live bees just to be kind of hovering around that nest um but then when the kids are running uh to go jump in the water uh that was all fake bees that was some early cgi work um just making the you know you can barely see them in the movie but um there's just some little black shapes kind of chasing them and that was again some very early CGI work. And that's a classic, classic movie um, that will forever be classic. I mean, I I love that movie. Um, I, I mean, and you've worked on so so many different things, um, which is you know amazing that you know you have had a, a full and thriving, successful career. Um, is does One Tree Hill have a particular? special place for you i mean it's okay if it doesn't but i mean is it one that sort of sticks out as you know one of your fonder experiences it it does but if i can just backtrack for a second um to my girl which was a, a fantastic experience um that was many years before one tree hill of course and uh, i was still kind of coming up through the the ranks as it were so i was the onset dresser for that show and the onset dresser is a position that uh, works closely with the prop people on set 
and the the on-set dresser is responsible for taking care of all the set dressing materials and making sure that everything is in its proper place. And when the camera comes into a room, say, and uh, the onset dresser has to move some furniture out of the way so to accommodate the camera. Then when the scene flips around and shows the other side of the room, the onset dresser has to put everything back and make sure that it looks exactly the way that the set decorator and the production designer intended. Um, so I was on, on set for that movie, like, every single frame of that show uh and just uh you know that was obviously one of Macaulay Culkin's first movies and um I don't want to spoil the movie for anybody that hasn't seen it but uh if you haven't seen it put your hands over your ears but uh, Macaulay Culkin's character dies from the bee stings and uh one of my jobs was lifting him in and out of his casket in the funeral scene. Um, so I had a very close relationship with Mac at that time. Um, in fact, he, uh, when we were on set and just not like he wasn't having to be on camera, uh, my, my oldest daughter got to play with him uh, as a kid. She was a couple years younger than he, but, they rode bikes together and just goofed around and had a bunch of fun. Um, and I'll also say that uh, <clears throat> Dan Aykroyd and Jamie Lee Curtis were both just a dream to work with. They were fantastic. And I've worked with Jamie Lee several times since then. And she is just a phenomenal person. Uh, nicer than you even think that she is based on what her personality is obviously in her public persona, but she is even nicer in person. Um, just that was a fantastic experience. Now, as far as One Tree Hill goes, it does hold kind of a, a special place um, because it's one of the longest projects I've ever done. Um, you know, I did about seven years of work on that show. So, um, you know, made very strong bonds with a, a whole bunch of people. Um, it's the longest running series to uh, ever be filmed in North Carolina. Uh, and to this day, I get uh, people asking me about that show all the time. Um, I mean, obviously you contacted me to be a part of this. Uh, I get people at, at least every couple months, someone emails me about, you know, where did you find this thing from Brooks Nursery? Or, you know, how did this thing come about at Club Trick? Or do you have anything you can give me from the show? It's just, you know, or people just call or uh, contact me and say how much they loved the look of the show, you know, and um, I, I'm always very flattered that people think to uh, <coughs> reach out to a set decorator and acknowledge uh, their work. It's, I find it very flattering. Well, and as as you should, you should be flattered. I don't. Is that the right word? I don't mean it like that. I mean, you know, people should do these things, and you should be receiving <laughs> these messages. I mean, just. Just to quickly go back to my girl, uh, and then just to talk on that. Uh, so, Macaulay Culkin, I, I, he's a few, he's a few years older than me, uh, but I grew up like idolizing him, you know, from Home Alone, you know, the Home Alone movies, and Uncle Buck, and you know, My Girl, and, and uh, all the rest of it. So it's so cool that uh, you know that you had that that bond and connection with him, and that you know you, um, your your daughter got to play with him. Like that's so cool love that and Dan Aykroyd is the hero of mine as well Ghostbusters and Jamie Lee Curtis as well for you know all of her work so so cool that when you get to hear stuff like that that um you know people are really cool in real life and then with regards to One Tree Hill I mean yeah it definitely is like a teen soap 
drama is something that's really special to me that I watched when I was uh, actually in like my mid 20s I got to it a little bit late um, but it was really impactful the reason that we do this podcast is because it's something that actually was impactful in my life and helped shape like change my career and all kinds of things um, so it, these shows are really important to people and you were a massive part of that and like the way that it looks and the aesthetic and everything um it's it's key and I mean something that you did for me which is like I've been enjoying these sort of props and little uh, trinkets from shows and movies that I love for like a few years now and you are by, by far had done me the kindest thing that anybody has ever done I've mentioned it loads of times like on the podcast and to other people um I was desperately trying to find these posters uh, that were in the background of um, of Mouth in the later seasons when he's like with Mouth and Millie and doing their like news show and everything. And I'd seen one somewhere and I'd contacted someone being like, oh, I love that. I think that's so cool. Uh, is it something that, you know, you'd be looking to sell or something that maybe I could maybe just get a copy of or something like that? And they were trying to they were trying to charge me a thousand dollars. Wow to have to either to to pay for it uh which then went up to two thousand dollars and then I was like well can I just maybe have a copy of it like I just want it as a fan I don't want it for anything else and and so I was like I just I just want to have you know a little something on my wall or whatever and then I con I was contacting you anyway I'd already contacted you before about trying to get you on the podcast and I just mentioned it as a PS I was like do you know if there's anywhere that I could maybe find this or whatever and you were like I'll just send it to you I found the file and I was like what <laughs> and I was like okay well can I can I pay you for the shipping can I pay you for this and you're you like no you wouldn't even let me pay you to ship it from the US to the UK I have them here uh framed and um they're just like one of my prized possessions and I can't believe it was completely out of kindness and um I'm really touched by that and really grateful. Thank you so much. You're you're more than welcome, Simon. It was my pleasure to do it. Um, I could tell that it meant a lot to you. And um, you you came to the right source. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny because um, I didn't personally ha- still have that file, but I was working with Bill Davis at the time that you contacted me and as I mentioned previously he was the art director and uh so I asked him we we were doing a a show in Richmond Virginia called Swagger which is currently on Apple TV now um and <clears throat> so I just went next door to his office and said hey man do you do you still have those files from One Tree Hill of the posters we made for Mouth and Millie's show and he's like yeah, I'm sure I do. So, I mean, it took him all of three minutes to find them. We printed them in house and, uh, you know, it was, it was no sweat for us to, to do something kind for you. And, uh, so you have, you have Bill to thank as well because it, he's the one that actually had the file, but we're, we're glad it for you. Well, thank, thank you to Bill. Thank you to you. I mean, and it, it's so special to me because I feel like it's even more special than the one that the, if than like the one that was in the show because it was like it was sort of oh, it wasn't made for me but it was manifested for me I just it, yeah it's just it's so they're very special to me and I'm very grateful and it just shows uh you know the type of person that you are um and so yeah very grateful well, again, you're uh, you're you're very welcome, and uh, I'm humbled by your appreciation. But uh, um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of nice people in the movie business, um, like Jamie Lee and Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, and that's and that's wonderful because you know we are all such fans of this stuff. It's so nice when that you know is the reality um i've got i've got a load of one tree hill questions um and i i put it out to some of our listeners and there's all kinds of things here um so 
obviously if you can't remember or it wasn't something that you was part of and whatever then you know it's completely fine and I realized it was a while ago um so okay right this is a bit of an odd one (laughs) so let's see what you think about this um Right. At the end of the show, they uh, the river court, the basketball court, um, they cut up. They, they removed it. Right. Because it was was they would made it for the show. And then people had cut up parts of the concrete and uh, and sort of put them in these boxes. And people, there's like 300 or so of them. And then people, they sort of turned up on eBay and those kind of things. Like, did you have anything to do with that? And what do you think about people owning a little piece of concrete that was, you know, the we, basketball court? Right, the river court. Um, God, we should so many times. Um, we we all thought it was kind of hilarious at the time that that we were cutting up the having the court cut up, and that people would even be interested in in having a piece of that asphalt. Um, I mean, but at the same time, folks used to come and camp out by the river court when they knew we were going to be shooting there. And, you know, we'd have a crowd of between, I don't know, sometimes it was three or four people. Sometimes it was 20 or 30 people who would just come to watch the filming there at the river court. Um, they were always very, you know, well behaved, so to speak. You know, they never impeded things in any way, but they would always come and watch. Um, and so the, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure whose idea it was to, br- I mean, we had to remove it, obviously, because that was at uh, what's called Battleship Park uh, here in Wilmington. We We always had to hide the USS North Carolina, which is a, a battleship that is parked right beside the, the river court there. So we always had to angle away from it, or uh, I guess they sometimes painted it out. Um, but uh, we had to remove it. And I, I'm i not sure whose idea it was to sell some of those pieces, but that was part of the auction process that happened at the very end nice well yeah it's cool i really like it my co-host dom thinks it's crazy but <laughs> well we did like like i said we spent a lot of time there so if there's any iconic location from that show that certainly is one of them yeah for sure um, the other was rick trick as well which they is uh they use for conventions and things now so i don't know if you're aware of that i had heard that yeah the marsteller building so that's that's cool um i don't know if you had any hand in this but the books so like in the later season lucas has his book and there's actually loads of props of the book and dan has his like self-help book and and those kind of things uh there were some questions around that were were there actually anything written on the pages or was it just blank pages in the book um yeah uh i think they were all uh just other books like um you know, um, books that maybe too many copies were printed of and we were able to access them inexpensively. And then we just put the book covers on them. There was never, there was no actual novel. I forget what his book was called. Unkindness of Ravens. Kindness, yeah. Um, yeah. Those were all just covers on other books. That's clever. That makes that makes sense. Um, were were there? Would you usually have multiple copies of each prop? So, like, say something like um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the top. Like, okay, like say like the posters and things that were put into the backdrop. Would you like print off a couple of them just in case something happened, or would things like that in the background you'd just have one? Yeah, we would typically um, 
it, de it depends certainly on what it was. Um, we almost always have at least a double of everything um, just in case something does get broken or, you know, missed or what have you. Um, as far as props themselves go, you know, um, again, Robbie Beck was our prop, prop master and uh, he pretty much always had three of everything. Um, that's kind of the rule of prop. You want to, you want to always have one for on the set and two backups. Uh, so <clears throat> in the case of those posters, we, I think we had several framed versions because there were uh, a number of locations around the TV studio set where those were hanging. Um, and then of course we projected them on TVs and monitors as well. Nice. Yeah. It's really cool. Uh, Peyton's drawings and like her artwork we know that you know Hilary Burton wouldn't do them someone else would do them she might like likely sketch over the top of them uh, was was that something that like was auctioned off or would did you have like did you have to work with the artists and they'd do loads of different drawings and you'd pick which ones um <clears throat> they I'm I'm honestly not sure what happened with those at the end um, those were, of course, drawn by another artist mm -hmm. uh, in, whose name escapes me right now, but she is also a set designer and sometimes art director, graphic designer. Um, and, you know, she would talk to Mark Schwann, the series creator, uh, or whomever the director was of the episode and, uh, you know, get notes about what kind of imagery they wanted in the drawing and then she'd make a couple passes and they'd say yes more like this less like that et cetera, et cetera. and it would go through several permutations until they got the one that wound up being on camera nice great answer uh so where do all the props go are they used in other shows yeah we discussed that um yeah asked about the book <laughs> uh so a funny one uh dan's heart gets eaten by the dog <laughs> she's like a classical <laughs> moment uh what was it made of or was it like a pig heart or something um <laughs> the one that the uh dog actually appeared to be eating I'm honestly not sure what that was made of. Um, it was, uh, I don't know if it was chicken or uh, if it was, we had several rubber ones. Again, these are, these are prop things, uh, not set dress things, but I can't remember. I think I actually was on set during that. Um, I think we did have a pig heart um, and we had several rubber hearts that uh, I think one of them actually is, is still in my prop house. One of the ones that we, we had um, and Robbie's probably still got one as well. Um, but I would, I'd have to ask him what the dog actually snuffled, but that was <laughs> cut we we always said that was like the jump the shark moment um for the show uh i don't know if you get that reference um but uh the dog ate the heart uh just seems so outrageous to us we were like after this anything literally anything can happen on this show if we can get away with a dog eating a heart transplant <laughs> It, it was perfect because it 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 would have been it wouldn't have worked if it happened to any other character. It's because it happened to Dan and he needs his like redemption and whatever and because he killed his own brother. But yeah, I mean the show definitely becomes uh, a wackier, let's say, as it goes on. Um, but you know, I feel like shows have to 
evolve to a certain extent and become a bit larger than life the longer that they go on for because the audience needs you know new new things but uh right. i mean was was dan a like a particular favorite character of yours you know as like being able to like being maybe like a similar age to him when when and to the older uh to the adults in the show when you were working on it yes yeah uh first of all i got along really well with paul johansson um you know he directed a number of episodes as well and um uh, i like paul a lot uh and he was definitely my favorite character on the show um just because he was such a diabolical you know um i mean later he kind of came around but uh uh he still had his his roots um so yeah i if there's anybody to identify with it was it was him um uh although i'm you know obviously a much nicer guy than than dan was um so yeah yeah he's great i mean we he was our first um sort of uh person that we had on the show like first sort of cast member and he was he was so nice and so so kind to us um yeah such a such a nice guy i imagine he must have been so cool to work with pretty Um, going um and just to your point that you made um you know about the show kind of becoming larger than life and um you know a little more outlandish so shall we say um you know the part of the reason that um after season four when we started season five uh the decision was made to jump over the college years and advance the show to you know their post college years when they were entering the workforce and you know having their careers was because those kids had done more in high school than anyone ever does in college. I mean, their experiences as, you know, teens was far beyond what anyone experiences in college. So it was like, we've already done everything they could possibly do in college. We have to get them out into the world. We're done with school. And, you know, fortunately all the kids were old enough to make that believable because they, you know, really they were playing characters much younger than what their real age was um and so we you know everything that everybody did in that show was to some degree unrealistic i mean you know either they succeeded with the task they were trying to do in such an unbelievably great way that they just transcended what almost anyone could ever expect to come of it. You know, I mean, Haley became a rock star and Nathan made the NBA and, you know, Brooke had a monstrous clothing line. You know, Lucas had a best-selling book. I mean, it was just like either whatever they did succeeded beyond their, anyone's wildest aspirations or failed in such a spectacular flaming nosedive that it was like how could you ever come back from this i mean if that really happened in your life you'd want to crawl in a hole and die you know um so it was one or the other nothing was ever like you know moderate it was either spectacularly successful or insanely bad and wrong so that was part of the fun of it <laughs> honestly well, that that's a great way to put it. And uh, I always say to Don, my co-host, that the way we have to look at these like teenagers, I look at them as if they're already like in their college years or in their early 20s, because some of the like, the fact that Nathan and Haley have their own apartment and they're still in high school, you know, and like how they're paying their own bills and all the rest of it. So I, I always try to think of them as they're not even adolescents they're like young adults at this point or they're more like the ages that they're actually are in real life and then when it jumps in season five then they're sort of playing 
you know, like mid twenties when they're actually trying to kind of play in early twenties, but I imagine them as older because it's crazy. And then, like you said, they must be the most successful group of friends to ever exist. Everybody made it, you know, I mean, Mouth has, you know, he's a TV personality and, uh, you know, we kept waiting. Oh, and skills is like, you know, DJ crazy success. Um, I mean, just, yeah. Name a group of friends that all had that kind of career path. It's amazing. But, you know, and, and, um, and in later years, you know, Julian or. Uh, yeah, that's it. Julian, a, yeah. A filmmaker. And he goes to the Sundance Film Festival. And uh, what was her name? His girlfriend. Uh, a Brooke. He, is, he gets with Brooke in the end, doesn't he? Oh, are you thinking about. Um, or no. Um, yeah. Quinn. Yes. Bro- uh, Haley's sister, um, you know, world-renowned photographer, uh, which allowed us to go to Puerto Rico, which was awesome. That was that was one of the most fun shoots uh, ever. That's uh, another reason it has One Tree Hill has a very fond spot in my heart. Uh, that it introduced me to working in Puerto Rico, which was fantastic. We had such a great time there. Um, were were yeah. there challenges with that in terms of from like a set dressing uh, point of view? Because you had, you're, you're having to source that stuff locally rather than, you know, going to your traditional vendors, I guess. It, it was a bit difficult, um, but fortunately we were we shot at uh, the El Conquistador Resort. Um, so they were extremely accommodating and let us, you know, we had carte blanche there. We could move anything of theirs that we wanted, use everything that they had. Um, we really <clears throat> didn't have much in the way of problems other than, I don't, if you remember that episode, uh, the film shoot that Quinn does involves this massive king size bed sitting in the water kind of in a tide pool and that bed was a handmade piece that I bought in Puerto Rico uh, that was literally made uh, with machetes like the wood was carved with machetes and it was assembled one time and I bought it out of the showroom floor this furniture place there and we had to disassemble it completely, even though it wasn't, it was not made to be disassembled. So we had to take it apart just to get it out of the store and into, you know, transport it to the resort and then get it out on the beach and then reassemble it. That was a bit of a nightmare, but it looked amazing sitting out there. Yeah, that's a great shot. Um, a fun note we we left the bed there at the resort and uh put a cabana over it and it became something that people could uh go and relax on you know guests of the hotel could go and lay on it in the shade and look at the ocean oh that's cool there there you go they're about to get a flood of one tree hill fans now that know about that are going to go over and and sit (laughs) on it I wonder if it's still there. I mean, they've had that horrific hurricane uh, since then. And I imagine, you know, it, it may not have made it through that or just the age since we left it there. But for a couple of years anyway, it was it was a great thing they had. Very cool. Um, well, an- another episode that just came to my mind that must have been must have been massive for set dressing and for props and decorating everything is the episode that Chad Michael Murray directed. I think it's in season six when it like, is it like set in the twenties? Yeah. Um, that must've been a mammoth of a, of an episode. 
that was that was a very challenging episode um but also one of my favorites and i'm glad you mentioned that because uh when i was thinking about doing this with you um that was one of the things that came to mind was the jazz club set that we built um that was all built on stage uh from scratch uh alan hook made a beautiful design uh for that and we that was that was one that we had to kind of fight with the producers on to get enough money to to realize it fully because you know it was an expensive proposition uh we had so much neon in there and you know so much lighting and tables and chairs and bar stools and you know the we had some budgetary battles on that episode but i think it wound up looking fantastic yeah it looked really great like and it looked it looked bigger than a one tree hill episode if you know what i mean like it looked more expensive like it looked like it could have been you know like like part like scenes from a movie or something yeah and that's that's definitely what we were going for you know we wanted it to look like a film noir from the 40s um and I, I think we achieved that yeah i love yeah i love that um i don't know if you were i i'm assuming you wasn't maybe this was just before you said you came in in season three mm, yes oh, okay i was going to ask there was an episode in season two where they nathan's like in a coma and everything flips around um like he met he imagines what would happen if he had lucas's life and vice versa and i was going to ask about set dressing and that because they changed the cafe to be in den's den deb's den i don't know if you ever saw that episode they changed the cafe into being a bar and yes i i saw part of that episode but i i was not involved that was that does predate my time on the show is it that was that was dom's least favorite episode so it doesn't that <laughs> doesn't matter um do with that <laughs> yeah all the good stuff comes from season three onwards of course um okay this is an interesting one i don't know if anyone's like reached out to you about this because so uh, i'm sure that you're aware but sophia bush hillary burton and bethany joy lens have a massive podcast uh drama queens that's talking about their experience on one tree hill they did start after us we were a good year and a half before them but it's fine you know it's more their show than ours so that's fine um but hillary burton has said on that podcast that she would love to be able to find and purchase the comet car um that was used in the show or one of them and she believes one is in australia and she doesn't know where the other one is so i thought we best ask do you have any idea where that car might reside i do not um i have not seen it since uh but i would i have a couple of transportation uh, friends who might have an idea on that I'll I'll ask them next time I see them. There um, you go. You could be making Hillary Burton's dreams come true right there. I love Hill. She's she is such a sweetheart. Um I need to be on their show too. Jeez. You do. This is the we we're, we're doing the warm up here really, you know, and then I'm sure you know you should be on there as as should you know all of all of the guys and people that you know work behind the scenes that that brought it to fruition i mean it's really nice what they're doing on their podcast i don't know again i don't know how familiar you are with it but they're sort uh, of taking so say that again uh sorry i'm i'm not familiar with their podcast right okay um, well they're they're kind of doing um they're kind of reclaiming it because they there was some they had some traumatic experiences within within the show as much as they had you know such great experiences with it as well there was some traumatic parts and they're sort of reclaiming the the show and getting sort of uh replacing negative memories with positive ones so things like the car they were saying that you know they'd like to get the car and like ride ride in it together and you know all these kind of things so it's um 
yeah it's a really positive positive thing um so yeah i'm sure she would love it if that was somewhere where she could buy it or something yeah that's that's awesome that's a good thought yeah um okay so sunkist sunkist was a massive sponsor at one point and and i love the fact that there was no effort to hide it like i loved it there was just hey suddenly Haley's wearing a sunkiss t-shirt and oh sunkiss have sponsored this so there's loads of sunkiss logos everywhere i mean was it fun for you to sort of include that stuff in or did you find it a bit of like a chore to have to include this stuff um <clears throat> that that episode was done while i was doing props on set so i was the one making sure there was always a can of sunkissed in, in in almost every shot um they for whatever reason they came in as a massive sponsor and i mean they gave the show a large sum of money to be involved and um I mean, it only lasted for that one episode, I I think. Um, it was and, in quite a lot. They had the cans and stuff sort of ran throughout quite a long period of time. Um, that whole thing, we, we kept it up. But it, there was one episode in particular where it was over the top, just sun-kissed everything, like um, sun-kissed Tree Hill. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was honestly a little overly corporate for my taste um you know i don't have any problem at all with product placement i love uh you know getting product placement for the shows that i decorate and uh it lends a sense of reality to whatever you're doing because people do use real products you know if you're trying to emulate real life uh people have to be drinking Sunkist or Coke or Pepsi or, you know, whatever it is. And <clears throat> being able to incorporate products like that rather than creating fake products to use, which the audience immediately recognizes as fake, you know, that can tend to take people out of the reality that you're trying to create. Um, so I'm all for product placement as long as it's not, heavy handed you know if it fits in naturally uh, i'd do it all day yeah for sure i love that uh, and I, I often when i'm watching shows and someone has got a can of coke or something i'm always wondering did coke pay for that or so actually that's an that's an interesting question so say if like in i don't know like cobra kai or you know a show that's filming now if someone has a can of coke in their hand and you can clearly see the label are we to assume that that has been paid for or sometimes will will the show just do it anyway and if they do do it do they have to get permission from coca-cola in case it was like a villain drinking coke and it could somehow like hurt their brand or anything um, that's a great question. Uh, typically, there's if there's not um, some kind of a payment for using the product on camera, there is at least permission um, in almost all cases. Um, there's such a thing as fair usage, which is a legal term meaning that if a character in the show is using a product in the way that it's intended to be used and not, you know, it's not a villain hitting someone over the head with a can of Coke or, you know, whatever it is, um, that it's fair usage. You know, you're just showing someone using a product that's readily available to everyone in the public. Um, you can do that most often in cases where you're showing a number of different products, like, you know, if you're only showing one can of soda, you typically have to have permission for sure. But if somebody's walking past an aisle where there's, you know, Bud Light and Miller Light and Heineken and, you know, 16 other brands, then everybody's getting some kind of play out of it. And that is, again, fair usage. It's a great answer. 
I love it. I feel like I'm being educated. I, I'm, you know, I'm a bit old to be an intern, but you know, if you ever need one, I'm, I'll fly over. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. The, unfortunately, the internship programs have uh, kind of gone by the wayside uh, due to some lawsuits that were filed a, a few years ago where some interns were being overtasked by department heads and uh, some studios got sued. And um, so there's not a whole lot of interning these days. Well, that's fair. Well, maybe I'll just come over as a volunteer. Well, we're friends now. So I'll just come over as a friend and I can just help out for a day. (laughs) If you make it over here and I'm on a show at the time uh i'd be happy to have you as a guest on the set for sure oh wow that'd be amazing well we're (laughs) we're planning so this podcast is going to take us four years and we're coming up to uh coming up to two years uh in summer so when we get to 2024 uh we're actually going to fly out to wilmington with some of our uh with some of our like ravens and fat like listeners and whatever and we're gonna you know go to all the sites and hopefully there'll be a convention we, we can tie it in so i'll definitely hit you up when uh that when we're planning that stuff out and uh yeah i mean at, at minimum it'd be great to buy you a beer or something you know right on yeah i'm i'm all for that definitely let me know when when that occurs i will thank you um Okay, this one is a popular question. Record Peyton had a has a massive record collection, like huge. Um, was that something? Did anything ever happen with with those? Was that part of like what uh, was sold at at the end? And was it difficult to accumulate that collection? Um, the <clears throat> her record collection came. That was probably one of the first things purchased for the because. Um, you know, that appeared in her bedroom from from the get-go. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure. I, I think they just found um, someone on Craigslist who was selling a massive album collection. And they just bought that and, you know, used that for filler. I mean, I've I've personally done this several times on other shows where big record collections were necessary and I just buy them randomly, you know, either from thrift stores or secondhand shops or, or from an individual that you can find, you know, on Craigslist or somewhere. And then any of the specific albums, of course, you purchase as single, you know, one-offs, you know, if she's listening to the Pogues or, you know, the Beatles or whomever you get permission from, then you just buy that album and include it in her collection. Oh, great answer. Uh, What was your favorite set to decorate or dress and, you know, be involved in like the, one of the ones that's, you know, used all of the time. Right. Well, I knew you were going to ask that question. And uh, I would say that my, my favorite, permanent set that we had uh was red bedroom records uh his record label um we just when we finished that set we knew we had something really cool and it was such a comfortable set um you know we all wanted it to be like our office you know just wanted to go hang out there um because it was just a very cool set to be on and um everybody that we ever showed it to like including my parents um just loved it and everyone was always blown away by the fact that the bricks were fake um you know it's it looks like it's a a brick inside a brick building but you know it was a set on stage the interior and uh the all the bricks were just uh fiberglass skins that were put up by the construction department and then each hand painted by the painters wow. to, to look realistic um but yeah that was that was definitely my favorite of the permanent sets um 
Karen's Cafe. The well, I I enjoyed a lot doing uh, the Clothes Over Bros store, and then trashing that and revamping it to the new Karen's Cafe. That was also great um, and really fun to do. Um, and we also this wasn't a permanent set, but at one point we built the Clothes Over Bros headquarters in New York. Um, and that was a really fun set to do. That was huge and sprawling. Um, so I enjoyed that. And you did, you asked about, you know, the sets that were permanent, but the one we alluded to earlier, that jazz club set, that was definitely one of my favorites. Wow. All so cool. I mean, the, yeah, the clothes over bros, like, headquarters is very cool very like devil wears prada and that sort of thing that's great and then uh yeah the, those bricks i always thought that it was like filmed in the same in the actual building where like trick is and you know it's meant to be at like, the back and whatever so you completely fooled me <laughs> yeah that fooled everybody um yeah it, the the painters and construction all did a fabulous job on that place and then fortunately we didn't screw it up with set dressing and uh it it all came together really well um let me i i gotta tell you one other thing um when in the episode where uh julian's movie plays at the fictional uh sundance film festival whatever they called it the wasatch film festival or whatever we got to shoot in the actual uh theater where the sundance film festival is actually held so we went to park city utah and shot all up and down main street there and um you know shot at the the theater and uh that was just such a blast we had this huge house that all the, the girls had rented with a hot tub that I brought in to put on the deck out there. Um, we had to crane that thing into place, by the way, because it was so heavy and there was no access. So we had to use a crane to get it in place. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, we all went skiing and uh, sled riding and just had a wonderful time. And I can tell you that the, snow fort that features in it that uh the little boy uh jackson <laughs> whatever his character's name was um David. He got, yeah uh alan hook and i built that ourselves out of real snow no <laughs> way we, that's awesome made a snow fort one sunday morning it was going to shoot monday morning at like i don't know 6 a.m or something and Alan and I went there with some local hire set dressers and hand handmade the snow fort. That's phenomenal. So that that's so cool. Like I wish I could point to something in a TV show and go, "Hey, see that snow fort? I made that." Like that is so awesome. Like that that stuff lives there in infamy. I mean, um, that also reminds me of an episode that we just watched uh, not too long ago, which actually is similar in a way um so I, I thought i'll ask you about it is when in season three is season three yeah towards the end of season three where they go to rachel's parents cabin and there's also like a hot tub there and it's uh like skills and bevin get lost in the woods um pete wentz from fallout boy is there randomly right right do, do you remember or like was that was that uh like one to dress or was like you rented the cabin and already you know came furnished and whatever God, I'm, I'm mixing that up with a Dawson's Creek set um what a cool a very, position what a cool position to be in <laughs> we did a, a very similar thing on Dawson's um God, I'm, I'm kind of spacing that. Um, for, for one thing, I think actually when when Fallout Boy was on the the show, I what season was that? You're in season this, three. 
we're currently at the beginning of season four, but I think that happened at sort of the end of season three. Okay, yeah, because see, I was I was on set then, um, so I don't really remember. I didn't decorate that set. You know, I was doing props, um, so I honestly can't remember just what how that came together. Sorry. No, oh, it's cool. Wait, wait. <laughs> You're on the show for a long time. How how many seasons of Dawson's Creek did you do? Uh, four. Yeah, four. That's very <laughs> cool. I mean, I, I actually also as like a side project, also doing a podcast covering Dawson's Creek, but we're doing it in a. It's my first time watching it, but we're doing it different. We're doing like one podcast episode for every half season so it's like a a lot quicker oh. but that's uh that's crazy that that you did that as well i i have to have another conversation with you at some point about dawson's uh, creek because yeah that's fantastic um right I'll, oh sorry go on I, I said okay yeah oh like i would do that for you you're the best i i'll just get through some of these ones i don't want to hold i don't want to keep you for so long because i know i know you're a busy guy um and i appreciate you know everything you've you've said already um okay so (laughs) this is an interesting one so someone asked um and they're asking like as if you specifically did this they said also (laughs) why did he only choose to have Brooke's laundry room upstairs? That's all we know about the second floor of her house. <laughs> um, I, I assume he's talking about her, the later years house, her condo. Yeah. Um, there was nothing upstairs. Uh, the stairs led to a landing and we didn't, there was no second floor uh, at all. Um, you recall there was, uh, you know, kind of an open floor plan, a big kitchen with the bar and a dining room table and then a living room. And then her bedroom was off the short hallway and there was a bathroom and then the, what became the nursery. Um, which I think before that we had it dressed as a, just like a second bedroom. Um, but yeah, there, I don't even remember the laundry room scene, but. Uh, <laughs> I don't either, to be honest. But wherever, wherever we had the laundry room, it wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, there was no laundry room. I love that. Uh Okay. Oh, you've already answered that about the sets for Julian's uh, movie, um, real rooms and houses are featured. Was it strange having to make sets that played sets? Oh, yes. So when uh, like Julian at the end gets like he's making his movie and it's going to be the One Tree Hill movie and and the rest of it, it said uh, someone asked, was it strange to make sets that are made to look like sets? if that makes sense Uh, no uh it wasn't that strange for us because um for one thing that's done frequently in shows you know there's oftentimes one of the characters is an actor or you know usually an actor maybe a director um but no we uh we actually used some of the older sets that we had like some what we call swing sets, which are, you know, walls that we have that can be reconfigured to make a, you know, if we need a one-off somebody's bedroom or, you know, a little storefront or whatever it is. Um, And a lot of that was like, you see the backside of it, you see the backside of the flats that we use. Um, So I think, some of that stuff was actually done on the stages where we were actually maybe shooting. Like uh, I seem to recall we were on, I think it was stage five where we had the red bedrooms, red bedroom record set. And we set up like the fake cast chairs from his movie and stuff. 
and we shot outside of red bedroom records. So you saw the, the backside of the walls and you didn't know what was inside, but you know, if, if you had gone in there, you'd have ruined the illusion, but, um, and then we used one of the other hubs at the studio where the, you know, some offices were as his production office. Um, there just didn't happen to be another show in there at that point. So the studio let us rent that out and turn it into the office for his show. That's awesome. So cool. So cool. So that's great uh, insight as well. Um, okay. This is an interesting one. This is one that's been up for debate on the podcast for a while. The sign that says, somebody told me this is the place where everything's better and everything's safe. You saw me just look over here because I actually have it on like a little thing on the pinboard. So I was cheating. But uh, oh, that beca- that becomes like an iconic like prop or sign and whatever. Um and it sort of emerges in season five was that something that was actually taken from the karen's cafe set that then they actually ripped it out or do you know if that was specifically made as we're going to make this a a thing that that brooke is going to like hang in her store that that was a piece that was actually in the original karen's cafe and they did cut it out and take it for for Brooks story. So perfect. It, it's been it answered from the original set. Yes. That's perfect because we've been going back and forth and wondering about that for ages. So that's awesome. Um oh Nathan has a load of trophies all of the time, you know, for basketball and all those kind of things. Was that like a pain to get made or did you like did you guys just get like, you know, 20 made at once and just oh yeah we have uh, um a couple of great trophy shops here in town and you know we just had him made for whatever thing he won or you know uh, it, initially there were just a bunch of you know maybe 20 or so to go in his room to show that he'd been playing for a long time and you know we had his name on all of them uh we had to make up, you know, silly, like, you know, conference champions or, you know, MVP of this tournament or that or whatever. It was all fictionalized. But, yeah, that was easy enough to do. We we do things like that uh, all the time. I just did another – the show I was talking about, Swagger, is also basketball-themed. It's about – um actually like middle school uh basketball players and had a ton of trophies made for that one too oh cool i have to check that out sounds sounds good um okay so these questions you've already answered uh but there there's two two ones here someone said they'd love to hear about the purple monkey so brooke has the per- the purple monkey at one point that she sort of is for when she's trying to like adopt a baby and it becomes kind of a a thing uh, any any <laughs> anything you can tell us around that unfortunately no because i mean i remember the purple monkey um but that was a prop yeah. um robbie beck would know more about that um I didn't, I think we played it in the nursery eventually. Um, but, you know, it, was, it wasn't something that I ever acquired. Fair. And then the personal question or my final question is, uh, what did, did you keep something specific to you? Like a, you know, a memento, something that you wanted as like a souvenir from the show that you like have displayed or keep somewhere? Um, I have, uh, a couple of things. Um, some of the, the signs, um, from the show are in my prop warehouse. Um, I've got, uh, of course, like crew jackets and t-shirts and hats and stuff like that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't keep any, like personal character stuff or anything we we couldn't have kept anything like that because 
again, all that went to the Warner Brothers archives. Right. And, and my buddy Robert Greenfield took all the best stuff for the prop in LA. Um, so cool. Of, co- of course he did, because that's his job. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I mean, I don't know. Have you, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a show on Disney Plus. Uh, oh, forgetting what it's called, but it's all about props. Um, and it's going through like the Disney archives and they sort of show some of the stuff and they each episode focuses on one one thing. So there's one about like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and it's showing the, uh, you know, like the laser the shrinker and whatever and what happened to it and they kind of restore it but if you haven't seen it i'm sure you'd be really interested in it or you probably already know all of this stuff anyway <laughs> but well you know um uh, i'm an insider but i i still like to watch some stuff like that because it's interesting to see what other people have done too you know um so yeah i'll check that out and how can how can we support you or how can our listeners best support you? Like, what's the best thing that we can do? Like, is is there somewhere people can like follow you or, uh, you know, can what can we what can we do to, to support you? Well, you can um, uh, you can certainly follow me on Instagram, um, Matt Sol set deck. Uh, and uh, it, it, however, my my. Instagram is woefully under underwhelming because uh, I just don't have time to uh, keep up with it that much. Although I'd I'd really like to, um, I, I have a goal of trying to kind of brand myself, and I'd love to get associated with either a, a furniture company or uh, um, one of these shows on the. Uh, one of the home and garden networks or someplace like that, like team up with uh, some other folks that do like a, a flipping this house show or, uh, you know, redesigning spaces and uh, kind of lend a cinematic viewpoint to some of these switchovers or um, reimaginings. Um I don't know that any of your listeners or viewers can help me in that endeavor, but uh, that's something that I could foresee myself getting involved in, in the future. Um, You know, kind of helping public people uh, reimagine their spaces to be more cinematic. You know, maybe somebody wants a a study that looks like uh, Don Vito Corleone's, from the Godfather, or they want, uh, you know, a room that emulates Indiana Jones or, you know, Star Wars or whatever. Um, you know, if people want to bring home the cinema, uh, I'd love to help be a part of that. That's um, awesome. That's I. If my wife would let me, that would be our entire house. <laughs> It'd be every room would be something like that. Well, we can we can definitely help in terms of we have we're very lucky and fortunate to have a very loyal, uh, dedicated, and driven, uh, supportive listenership. So yeah, as soon as you have things like that, well, we can help promote on our social media and Instagram and all of those things. Then please let us know, and we can obviously. Uh, you know point everyone into the direction on our other podcasts like on our weekly ones and be like you know hey check out you know Matt's new project here and follow him here and all that sort of stuff so yeah we would love to love to help with that stuff right I appreciate that that's all so if if any of your uh, listeners or viewers are uh, own furniture companies or uh, uh, you know are producers of one of these makeover shows uh give me a ring (laughs) excellent that sounds great well i i honestly i can't thank you enough uh this honestly this has been my favorite conversation with anybody that uh that we've had uh on the podcast i hope that none of the previous guests are listening but it's true Uh, i've really enjoyed it and uh, i could talk to you for hours days even about this stuff but um you know i know that you have a life so i will let you go but yeah thank you so much it's uh, it's been a real pleasure you're, you're welcome i've really enjoyed it myself and uh 
you know, I, I'd come back and talk to you again. Um, and about the Dawson's Creek thing as well, if you want to. So. Oh, that would be amazing. Yes, I, I would love that. I'll, uh, I'll for sure email you, um, you know, and obviously when you're a busy guy, but you know, when, when you have time, that'd be fabulous. And uh, yeah, thank you. I hope you have a, have a great evening. And um, yeah, I appreciate it. All right. I do. Have a good one, Simon.